I remember when we went to the, uh, the church in Muncie, Pennsylvania, I remember the question and answer time that afternoon, and I remember it being at least 110 in the auditorium, I mean at least, and I said, uh, doesn't this bother you not having air conditioning? And they said, uh, well, the pastor always used to soak his, his shirt in ice water before he went up to preach. <laughs> I said, I'm not doing that. <laughs> And the uh, Lord blessed, and eventually we, <laughs> we got air conditioning. Hi, yay, yay. It's great to be in the house of the Lord with air conditioning and uh, see your non perspiring faces. I want to just uh, give you a word of encouragement. Men, I'm looking for a men's uh, ministry leadership meeting tomorrow night. So if you um, are a small group leader in men's fraternity, uh, we're going to be starting up Series 33. You'll hear more about that uh, in the next couple of weeks. And uh, so we're looking for uh, confirmation that you'll be back in there helping. If you uh, are interested in uh, men's ministry as a whole and you like the idea of planning some things and having some activities throughout the year, please feel free to come uh, tomorrow night, 7 o'clock, here to the church. If you can't make it, but you have that interest, if you just uh, flick me an email, that would be helpful, okay? Just so that I can stay in contact with you and uh, we can go from there. Well, these fine gentlemen have some Bibles in their hands. So if, you, if you need a Bible this morning, we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 4. Just slip up your hand and they'll make sure that uh, you are given a Bible here this morning so that you're able to follow along as we go through uh, the passages here today. The Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 4 is going to speak to some very practical issues for us. We're in a series entitled Multiplying Your Life. We've talked about multiplying your life through various things like service and uh, time management and being able to, to manage uh, a spiritual fitness in our spiritual lives. And we want to multiply our life in the sense that we want our life to be as productive as is possible. We come to Ephesians chapter 4, and the subject this morning is multiplying your life through having godly relationships. And one of the areas that affects our relationships the most is that of communication. Our communication is very telling about us. In Ephesians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul uh, begins this passage of Scripture uh, by speaking to some of the issues that contrast, for instance, the world and the Christian. There is a huge difference between how the world communicates and what the world does and what we as Christians should be doing. In fact, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, no doubt a verse that uh, we all should have uh, pretty well memorized. Uh, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is what? A new creature. That's right. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And so as a new creature in Christ, my life is supposed to be different. When you come to Ephesians chapter 4, I find it fascinating that the Apostle Paul deals with the hearts of those that are not of faith in Christ, whose hearts are darkened because of that lack of relationship with Christ. And Paul says this in verse 17, so I say and firm together with the Lord that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk. And the futility of their mind being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart, they having become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. Paul really lights this up. He speaks to the issue of who we used to be. And he points out some things that are really pretty ugly about what we used to be like. Paul starts it out by saying that uh, basically the darkness of their hearts are what the issue is. And when he talks about the darkness of the heart, he uses a word uh, that's a, it's an interesting term, and it does really light it up. It's the idea, we would get the English word porous from it. Uh, porosis is the word, and it speaks to the petrifying work of darkness. 
When you think of something that is hard, you start to get the idea of what this word means. In the classical use, oftentimes it was used of a very hard surface, something like a a marble, for instance. Some of you may have a a hard surface on your kitchen counters that that it's maybe it's granite or or some type of stone. This is the idea that the heart has become stone-like. And this word carries over into it because this heart is speaking of being so hardened and so petrified that it has no power to feel anything anymore. He says this is the darkness of man's heart. Man's heart is so without God that we are become callous and hard so that we don't feel the things that God is speaking to our heart about. That's how we used to be. He uses two other Greek words here in the same context that are very ugly Greek words. Uh, The one Greek word there is, and we get the the word sensuality in the New American Standard uh, translated that way. I believe the New King James translates it lasciviousness. You know when you hear the word lasciviousness, it's not a good word. And uh, there's other terminology that's used in different translations. But understand this about that word sensuality, which when we think of sensuality in today's uh, society, we really don't pick up on it as being that much of a, a grabber to, of our attention. But in the Greek, this was an enormous term. It really spoke about uh, these people who have abandoned themselves to any kind of unclean conduct. And this term, it really speaks, one, one person put it this way, it's a disposition of the soul that's incapable of bearing the pain of discipline. And the idea is that this sensuality is so wanton that it becomes obvious to those people around them without their concern. In other words, I'm really not concerned how you perceive me. I'll live my life, my life however I feel free to live it, and I really don't care what the world thinks. I really don't care what the church thinks. I really don't care what God thinks, and I certainly don't care what you think. What a term. This was an openness and an open sin. The next term there, and you have it translated, New American Standard uh, does the greediness thing, this uh, impurity with greediness. It's this idea of arrogant greediness. It's the idea that you want to possess something that's unlawful for you to possess. You want something that's not only not good for you, but you want something that breaks God's law in trying to obtain that for yourself. And this is what the sin nature is all about as our sin nature goes out to grab a hold of these types of vices, bring them into our life regardless of how they influence or affect other people. We live in a society today where these words are really out there for everybody to see. Isn't it true? We live in a society that as it's distancing itself from God more and more, becomes more and more fleshly, more and more wicked. It's it's not your imagination. You're seeing it as it develops right in front of your eyes. It's not your grandfather's grandfather who said, oh yeah, I remember when, no, you, you don't have to be that old to see how society is changing. And as you see how it's changing, you realize the significance of Jesus Christ who can come in and can change it all. The Apostle Paul goes on as he follows that up and he says, but you, verse 20, did not learn Christ in this way. It's not who you are. You're here this morning, and I hope that you are a follower of Jesus Christ. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, your life has been changed. You're a new creature. Uh, Things begin to change. And because of the newness that we have in Christ, our relationships are supposed to be different than the world's relationships. Now, that's not saying anything too profound, right? If the world is, is all filled with this type of, uh, of degradation, it's easy to see how the world could be affected. But we as Christians are supposed to be different. And the relationships that we have in our life are supposed to be different. 
Our homes are supposed to be different. And how we communicate with others is altogether different than how the world communicates. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Ask him to bless as we go through several verses here in Ephesians chapter 4 that will encourage us to communicate in such a way that is positive and encouraging, that reflects Jesus Christ well in the world in which we live. Father, how we thank you, Lord, that you have not left us to ourselves. You've given to us, Father, the Holy Spirit of God who works in us and produces a different result than what we were and who we were before we came to faith in Christ. Lord, help us to carry truly the truth to a world that needs to hear it. Help us, Father, to reflect the person of Jesus Christ as we communicate with others, that we might glorify you, Lord, in a way that makes you joyous. Father, bless this word, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the areas of relationship building is in the area of communication. And communication is so important that the Apostle Paul in verse 25 is going to start this out by using the word therefore. The word therefore always is an attention grabber because it always reflects back on all the things he previously said. And basically he's coming to the, to the crux of it and he's saying, therefore, for this reason, this is why this is important. And he's boiling it all down and he's saying, this is important for us to know today. And he tells us, therefore, laying aside, because we're new creatures in Christ, because we didn't learn Christ like the world has learned to live, we are to be laying aside, he says falsehood and instead we're to replace falsehood or lies with truth and he says speak truth then with one another so that we understand it we are members one of another one of the best ways to have a a positive relationship with someone is by speaking the truth to them that is christ-like communication isn't it What God is saying is what we need to do is make certain that we lay aside the falsehoods that would come out of our mouth. Now, lying is an enormous problem. In Revelation chapter 21, 8, we find out that it's an enormous problem for anyone who stands before the Lord. And at the great white throne judgment, when the judgments uh, are handed out, uh, he speaks to this issue. He says, but cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers, idolaters. And then he puts in there all liars. Can you imagine being in such a list? These are people whose habitual speech is speaking falsehoods. And they just naturally, it just flows out of their life. And the reason why it flows out of their life is because they're living or walking according to the God of this world, who is who? Satan. Take your Bible, if you would, and go over to John with me, would you? John chapter 8 and verse 44. In John chapter 8, we find Jesus, and he's talking to a group of the Jewish leaders, and he speaks to them about the freedom that they would have in Christ. He says, if you continue in my word, verse 31, then you're truly disciples of mine, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Later on, they would contest it, and they would argue over who their true father was. They say to Jesus, our father's Abraham, verse 39, he's our father. And Jesus said, if you're Abraham's children, do the deeds of Abraham, but as it is, You're speaking to kill me, a man who's told you the truth. Obviously, there's something wrong is what Jesus is saying. And Jesus says, if God were your father, in verse 42, you would love me, for I proceeded forth and have come from God, for I have not even come on my own initiative, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I'm saying? It is because you cannot hear my word. You are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature. For he is a liar and the father of lies. The NIV states that it's speaking in his native language. 
It is the native language of Satan and the byproduct of Satan is those of us who came into this world as fallen human beings. And without Christ, we will do the same thing that is of our sin nature, and that is we'll speak falsehoods. Because Satan, who is the small g, God of this world, is all about deception, deceit, and lying. He's deceived mankind over the years on many different points. These are enormous, enormous issues. And so today, people in the world have no problem, for the most part, with lying. We as Christians are supposed to stand out from the world. We're supposed to be different from the world. And we live in a world that's just awash with lies. Digging this up off of my cell phone, because I had this saved, I thought I'd forgotten my notes this morning. I went back to my office and said, I think that crazy iPhone will pull this up. And sure enough, it did. The percentage of adults today who admit to telling lies sometimes often is 12% percent of women who admit to occasionally telling harmless half-truths is 80 percent. Percent of people who admit to lying on their resumes, 31 percent. Percentage of people or patients who lie to their doctors, 13 percent. I'm doing fine, doc. <laughs> percentage of patients who stretch the truth to their doctor, oh, I feel great, 32 percent. Percent of patients who lied about following a doctor's treatment plan, are you taking your meds? 40%. Percent that lied about their diet and exercise. <laughs> 30%. You get the idea. There's two things you can say for sure about human beings. You know, um, we all have thumbs and we all are big fat liars. It says here, by age four, 90% of children have grasped the concept of lying and it just gets worse from there. How bad is it according to a 2002 study? This is a long time ago in, in today's world. There was a study by University of Massachusetts that said 60% of adults can't have a 10-minute conversation with a, without lying at least one time. Yeah. That number makes it sound actually better than it is. Those people in the study who did lie actually told an average of three lies during their brief chat. And I know you're sitting there right now insisting you'd be part of the 40% that didn't lie. That's what the liars in the study thought, too. <laughs> when they watched the taped conversations, they were shocked at how many fibs they told. You see, the problem is we lie to everybody. Our parents get the worst of it, according to the day America told the truth. 86% of us uh, would say that we lie to our parents regularly. Follow, listen, parents, 86% in 2002 said their kids were lying to them. 75% lie to their siblings. 69% uh, lie to their spouses. But here's the weird thing. In general, we don't lie about things that are only important. We lie about things that are dumb as well. There was a British film rental company, and they did a poll about the movie The Godfather. Now, how many of you have seen The Godfather? Raise your hand. Keep it there. All right. You've seen The Godfather. Well, what they found out was that 30% of the respondents lied about seeing The Godfather. <laughs> so if you just lied about seeing The Godfather, raise your hand. No, or, or stand up. Most people that said they, they, they saw The Godfather only remembered Brando's famous line, you know? You remember what that is. Gonna make you an offer you can't refuse. Sonny, you sit here. Something like that. Sometimes we do lie about things that matter. 40% of people lie on their resumes. That it is just a number that continues to go up and up and up. I have a friend who is uh, in a church uh, down in Florida, and uh, they found out that the pastor lied about having a doctorate. And uh, they asked him about it, and he said, uh, well, uh, well, uh, well, uh, and they never fired him, so he continued on. Can you imagine? You see, lying has become such an entrenched aspect that we as Christians, if we would live out our Christianity and be real in front of the world, 
the world is going to see a major, major difference. And that is, let me just say this, this that's one of the things that if you look for a silver lining, which, which is it's terrible to even probably go this route in our thinking, uh, but the truth of the matter is as the world sinks more and more away from God, the Christians tend to stand out more and more and more, which could be used as a positive motivator for us. You see, there should be a huge difference, according to this passage of Scripture, with regard to how you and I communicate. And we should be able to look at this passage of Scripture when Paul says, therefore, laying aside falsehood, speak truth with one another. It is absolutely significant that we would speak truth to each other. But in Moving from verse 25, if you go down with me to verse 29, let me just pick that up there. For the Bible is going to tell us that no unwholesome word should ever proceed out of our mouth. You see, we should be using our terminology and our words for those things that are positive. And we'll see in a moment just how that really looks. The word for unwholesome literally means that which is rotten. That which is spoiled. You know what your trash can smells like when it's 100 degrees outside? You just throw a little bit of that scrap of meat in there and you know what it smells like. You take your life in your hands, lifting the lid before you take that thing out to the trash. I talked to somebody who takes all their trash and their, their rotten garbage and they put it in their freezer and they freeze it so it doesn't stink outside. We had a situation where in the church up in Pennsylvania where we were, there was a problem in the kitchen. I went into the kitchen the one day and it smelled like something that had died in there and I thought maybe it was a mouse or something of that nature. And the women began to become concerned and so they went down there, several of them, and started to look around this kitchen. And they opened the freezer and they looked in the freezer and they opened the refrigerator door and oh, nothing. So they didn't know what it was. And so they came back the next week. They came back the next week. They started looking around, looking around, and, and I'm down there. And, and at this point, you know, it's starting to grow on the back of your neck when you're standing in the kitchen. And they're looking, and, they, and they're looking through the cabinets, and they, they open the cabinet door below the sink. And they looked under there. Oh, nothing. Nothing. They didn't know what it was. They kept searching around and searching around and searching around. And, and sometime later, after the, the air is literally green in this room, looks like the Rio pool, <laughs> they found it. There, someone had, when they were emptying out the freezer of the church, they'd set a box on the counter. And one brave soul reached over and took the lid off of that box where there was about 20 hamburger patties. <laughs> Been there rotting. Gross. You get the idea how repulsive that is, don't you? And we've all got stories of gross repulsiveness. So whatever runs through your mind right now, go with that. <laughs> That's the type of speech that God says shouldn't proceed out of the Christian's mouth. We didn't learn Christ this way. That's the unwholesomeness. And it should drive us crazy. It should push us away from that which is evil. And all of these things that we see today and all of the, the, the things that we hear. And yes, of course, it takes into, uh, includes uh, taking the Lord's name in vain and, and lying and, and, and those things that are corruptible speech and, and dirty language or dirty storytelling or, or slander or malicious words that are spoken. It takes all of that into into uh, account probably takes into account most tv show ads as well you see it's all that which is repulsive that which stinks and god says to his people what you need to do is replace that which is such a turnoff with things that are positive and he uses the words those words that are edifying let no unwholesome word Rotten words come from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification. One thing about edification, edification, as you know, we get the word edifice from it, a building, and the idea of edification uh, is to build up, as you know. 
But I think of a building that builds over time. Building something takes time. Whether you were in Jesus' day and it was one block at a time, whether you were working for the Egyptians and it was one brick at a time, or whether you're building a house in Gambrels and it's one board at a time, it takes time to build up. And we as Christians are called upon to be involved in building each other up. And over time, we want to be that person who brings encouragement. It doesn't stop there, and oftentimes we, we do. But you'll notice that next section where he says, speak the words that are good for edification according to the need of the moment. Do you see that there? According to the need of the moment. This ability to minister effectively, to be able to say words that are right on target for that moment, takes a great deal of wisdom. We want to be able to say the words that are going to bring about encouragement and build someone up. When this happens in a relationship, positive things come from that relationship. If you're building up your mate, you're going to say things that are conducive to that person being encouraged. Maybe you're speaking to your child. Maybe there's something that's going on in a person's life around you that is very, very painful. Having the words to say that are according or appropriate for that moment is absolutely essential. I love the verse of scripture in Proverbs 25, 11. It says, like apples of gold in a setting of silver, is a word spoken in right circumstances. Did you get that? Like apples of gold set in a setting of silver is a word spoken in right circumstance. Having the wisdom to be able to do that means that we have to rely on God so that we're super sensitive and able to say those things that are encouraging and minister in that way. He doesn't stop there. He continues to go on and he says, so that, here's the reason, so that it will give grace to those who hear. So that word that's spoken according to the need of the moment is important because grace needs to accompany that. Our words should be gracious. Sometimes, in all circumstances, truth is best. Lying is never acceptable. If we were to just speak truth, we would flip the world upside down. Can you imagine if the whole world had to tell the truth? I mean, could you imagine that? I mean, could you imagine political ads if they had to tell the truth? Vote for me, I'm really gonna hammer you. (laughs) Vote for me, you know, I've got nothing going for me, just vote for me, you know. I mean, can you, can you imagine, and I'm not picking on any candidates, you can just fill in the blanks. Um, <laughs> you know, on and on. I mean, can you imagine if world leaders had to sit down and actually tell the truth to each other? Can you imagine? I mean, telling the truth could flip things upside down. What is that movie, uh, Liar, Liar? But can you imagine all people having to tell the truth? Your wife wants to know, how does that dress look? (laughs) Sometimes when you and I speak, we need, when we present truth, to wrap it in grace. My wife always looks fantastic, I'm just telling you right now. (laughs) World leaders would have to stop before they lied and not say certain things. We would be careful about the speech that we used. We would be making sure that even by giving the truth, we weren't being harmful. Do you see the wisdom in being able to approach the whole aspect of speech? But we come to the whole issue of speech with a pure heart and 
We want grace to abound in this. Colossians chapter 4 and verse 6, that's a, that's a great verse. It says this. It says, consider yourselves with wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. And then he says this. He says, let your speech always be with grace as seasoned with salt. In other words, wrap that truth in grace and then give the truth if it's appropriate to give that truth. Be careful how you speak to others. Sometimes it's the better part of wisdom not to say anything at all. You see, God's word is telling us how we need to speak to one another. How it is that we can build each other up in the most holy faith. Verse 30 says this. It says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Literally, with the imperative mood there, with the negative, he's literally saying, stop grieving the Holy Spirit. It's not a question of whether or not we would do that. We do do that. And he says, you need to stop doing that. Because the Holy Spirit of God is grieved. Now, we could take that little section of verse out, stop grieving the Holy Spirit, and we could take it out of context and we could apply it to a lot of different things. But notice the context in which it's written. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only the words that is good for edification, according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. Stop grieving the Holy Spirit. You and I, as followers of Jesus Christ, have the Holy Spirit of God dwelling within us. He has a first front row seat to our heart. He hears everything we say. And even more daunting than that is he hears everything we think. (laughs) So the question is, if a tree falls in the woods and there's no one there to hear it, does it make a sound? The question really is, if we say something or think someone or s- think something and there's no one around to hear us, does God hear us? And the answer would be yes. The picture of the Holy Spirit of God grieving is a, is a, is a pointed picture because it's literally showing us the, the, the Lord and the Holy Spirit just weeping over what's coming forth from our heart. Matthew 15, 11 says, it's not what enters into the mouth that defiles the man, but what proceeds out of the mouth. This is what defiles the man. What comes forth from our mouth begins in our heart, you see. And the Holy Spirit of God is watching how we conduct our lives. He's, he's watching how we, we live life. And our communication needs to be that which is wholesome, that which is good, that which is building up. Today we live in a day where modern technology has made communication a whole nother animal, hasn't it? I mean, things that that we never did before. How many of you text? You send text messages during church. Oh. (laughs) You guys are quick. I mean, that was fast. (laughs) Texting has become very normative in our life. Of course, before that, it was emails. How many times have people sent emails without even thinking? And they've used vicious terminology, and they hurt relationships. Christians were supposed to be different. It should be our desire to be able to say we've never sent an email that we wish we could get back. We speak those things that are are true. We don't speak falsehoods. We speak truth. And not only do we speak truth, but we don't speak it in such a way that it would be hurtful. We season it. We wrap it in grace. We make it appropriate for the moment. All of those things show a wisdom in how we communicate. You see, what we need to do is we need to multiply our lives and make their lives more effective in the relationships that we have. And communication stands apart because it's so, so important. And we are so messed up because of our sin over it. Oh, Lord, give us wisdom as we communicate. May we communicate God's word in such a way that's pleasing to him. Amen. 
Would you bow your heads with me? We stop and we think about it. The most important decision that any one of us could make is our relationship with Jesus Christ. Verse 30 in our text says that we're sealed unto the day of redemption by the Holy Spirit of God. If you're here this morning and you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ, Jesus says, I'm holding on to my sheep. I've never lost one. God the Father says, I'm holding on to you. And so we're double wrapped between God the Father, Jesus Christ, and now we find that we're even sealed until the day of redemption by the Holy Spirit of God. You see, God has, in his trinity, wrapped himself around the believer. As a follower of Jesus Christ, you're secure in your faith because it doesn't come down to your righteousness. It's all about Christ's righteousness, you see. If you're here this morning and you've never placed your faith in Jesus Christ, there's no better opportunity that you have than right now to place your faith in Jesus. Maybe you've been having faith in Jesus and in your good works and maybe other things, but God is saying that it's faith in Jesus alone that matters. Do you know where you're going to spend your eternity? Maybe you're here this morning and you say, Pastor Kevin, I know where I'm gonna spend my eternity. I've made that decision to be a follower of Jesus Christ. How about your communication? Does God have control of your tongue? The Bible says no man can tame it. It's like a fire. You see, God wants to use the words that we say for his honor and glory as well. We didn't learn Christ is the same way as the world's life. Christ makes us different. God's working in your heart. I encourage you this morning to follow his lead. If you'd like to know more about placing your faith in Jesus Christ, we have personal workers here at the front. Maybe you want to just come and talk or pray with someone. We invite you to do that. But let's all stand. We'll have a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for the gift of Christ who came to this cross and suffered upon it, taking upon himself the sin of the whole world. Lord, no longer are we slaves to sin. What a joyous reminder. Help us, Father, to live out our faith now in such a way that's pleasing to you. Give strength, Lord, to each one who's here today to use their speech as that which is building up brothers and sisters in Christ, brothers and sisters in family, people all around them who touch our lives every day. May we truly reflect a Christ-likeness. Work in our hearts today, Lord. Help us not to leave here without necessary decisions that need to be made. And I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. God bless you.